Okay. I'm just wondering. You're gonna it's fine. Slouch a little bit. <laughs> it's fine. Slouching is my natural state, anyways. It's not good for you. No, it's not. There's a lot that's not good for me that I do. How are y'all doing? <laughs> We're a little punchy tonight. <laughs> I'm a little punchy tonight. I'm very punchy tonight. Lee, are you punchy? Yes, Lee's punchy too. <laughs> the cats are punchy. It's a punchy night. What's he playing with? Oh, he's trying to get his, his tail out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's currently through um, Ben's pelvis. <laughs> oh, now he's out your sister. So, hi, everybody. Oh, hello, Rob. You the mixed rub. that. I found the rub. You mixed that one. I don't think I mixed it. The problem. Uh, oh no, my glass is 3D. <laughs> there oh, yeah. we go. That's better. We look like we're we're doing the show out in the blazing sun on Facebook. Uh, all right. So. <laughs> but yeah. What so, have we been up to? <laughs> good evening, everybody. Yeah. What have we been up to? Have what we have, been up to things? And what haven't we been up to? <laughs> it's been. Uh, it was a very busy weekend. Yes, two busy weekends yes, since we last talked to you. So, this, yep, the, not this immediate past weekend, but the weekend before um, was Hanover Tavern Paracon, which was fantastic. Third year that we've done it. Um, third year of uh, having a good time up there. Yep, Chris so. was up there. Liam and Marsha were me for the night, for the day and the night, as I couldn't be there on Saturday, but I was there for Friday. Um, which was a very fun night. Yep. And um, good investigation. And then um, this past weekend, we hosted a conference for um, other ghost tour operators uh, here in Richmond City, and then they came from all over. Uh, got a lot of really good ideas. Marsha and Lee and Tiffany all participated, and they got some really cool ideas and insights. Yep. Oh, I, I have one that I want to talk to you guys about later. Okay, okay. good deal. That's what it's all about. Jeez. But yeah, no, it was really good. Couple of good weekends, <laughs> couple of very busy weekends, and uh, yeah, I can crash. Not yeah, relatively speaking, day jobs, but yeah, I can crash. But um, the cats have been. Um, they've been in a mood because two weekends in a row we have not been here. Yes. And they've been in a mood. Yeah. yeah. But they're not visitors. Yes. They were freaked out by that many yes. visitors. Yes. <laughs> we brought everybody by and they got to, got to see hello to the kitty cats and uh, that was exciting and overwhelming all at once. Yeah. So, but yeah, so Rick, Dana, Patrick, Roberta, Beverly, good evening everybody. Alex, Alex, good evening. What's up, Alex? So yeah, yeah we got a, got a good crowd here tonight. Good evening, everybody. And uh, if you haven't already chimed in, chime in, say hello. Happy, be, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, but yeah, so tonight we are bringing you Haunted Arkansas. Arkansas. And dun, dun, dun. yes. Did y'all mean to say in fandom? No. No, no not no, really. No, no, no. No, no. no. and uh, we are pronouncing it that way for the sake it of tonight. It ain't Arkansas. 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 No, Arkansas. Oh, um, we're not getting in on that debate. I'm just saying this is how we're pronouncing it tonight. We are not going to dictate how it is pronounced because not even the people that live in Arkansas can agree on how it should be pronounced. So, me, as somebody who has never been to Arkansas, will refrain from... Filing, filing judgment on that debate tonight. It's like Stanton and Stalin. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, oh, and what do we have tonight? Tonight we are, it's a... Um, Sprite and rum. Yeah, Sprite and rum. Um, one of the uh, folks from the, uh, the, the event this weekend uh, brought a bottle of rum, Guatemalan rum. Yeah, because uh, he's originally from Guatemala. And uh, the Sprite is per his recommendation. So, yeah. and it is it's quite tasty. good. Yeah. He got it at Costco, by the way, if anybody wants to go find it. Which means he tried, took it across straight lines. Because you can't buy you can't buy booze at the Costco's in Virginia. Yeah, and I like we haven't done that from Florida. You're allowed to take it across straight lines as long as it's not open. Mm. It wasn't open when he took it across straight lines. Yeah. <laughs> we opened it in the room. But, do you want to do the introduction tonight or no, should I? Get to I get to do the introduction? Because you had way too much fun with that. I did have fun writing this one. So, what can be said about the state of Arkansas? It's 
the home of Walmart. People have been arguing for over a century about how to pronounce it, and for, again, the sake of tonight, we are going to go with Arkansas. For reference, Arkansas is an anglicization of the francization of the Algonquin term for the uh, Quapaw people. Yes, there's a quiz later. Yes, keep it up. There will be a quiz. But really, <laughs> really, what else is there to say about this South Central state? And again, that's Anglicization of the Francization of the Algonquin term for the Paqua people. Qua, Quapa people. Yes. So, Arkansas is meant to be Quapa? Yes. Interesting. In Algonquin. Argonne, okay. And then the French did their thing. Do we know thing. what the Algonquin word was? Not exactly, no. Okay. But yeah, it was... Uh, there's a lot of laughter there, going there, out there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, so yeah, it was um, yeah, kind of a, a fun origin, if you will. Now, anyways, the state has a dark past, but they have had a hard time shaking. So get a little serious for a minute. So in the pre-Civil War years, it was heavily dependent on the plantation economy, which meant that it was dependent on slave labor. In the, po in the post-war years, it remained dependent on cotton crops, but the cotton market struggled for many years, leaving Arkansas economy in ruins. Now, Jim Crow dominated Arkansas law for decades, and Little Rock took center stage in the aftermath of the Brown versus Board of Education verdict as schools were closed rather than to submit to integration. And with so much pain at the heart of the state for so many years, it's easy to see why some people would rather turn the other way. That said, the state of Arkansas today is not the Arkansas of a half century ago. It's not perfect, but few places are. The modern state has diversified their economy, including a healthy tourism sector. And what are people going to see in Arkansas? Well, there is, of course, the natural beauty of the Ozarks. There's horse racing, hot springs, casinos, music festivals, and there's a whole lot more, too. So they got, uh, they got some stuff going on down there. And in looking at everything that has made Arkansas what it is today, there is plenty to fuel supernatural stories of every sort. From one end of the state to the other, haunting tales, both sweet and bitter, linger on around every corner. All right, so we're going to start with the Allen House. This is a Allen Towers? We have an Allen House. We do there. have well, we do. Mm. But this is in Monticello. Not that Monticello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just so y'all know. Monticello, Arkansas. We also have one of those. <laughs> yes, we do. Sorry, I have to adjust my knee real quick. My golly. <laughs> I know. This, this speed bag is actually like... Eating you? Eating me. <laughs> I am slowly sinking into the maw of this big bag. All right, so starting in southeastern Arkansas at the college town of Monticello, we have a lovely home that dates back over a century. In 1906, John Lee Allen commissioned a Sylvester, excuse me, commissioned Sylvester Hotchkiss to design a mansion that would impress potential clients. Allen was quite the prominent businessman in Monticello, and he felt that his success should be reflected in the home where his family lived. Okay, come on. Are you coming or not? He wanted to play on the iPad, but <laughs> you, you don't get to do that. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, here we go. Um, now, the uh, 8,500 square foot Queen Anne and Gothic style mansion was impressive indeed, and it would come to be a reminder of the Allen family's misfortune, rather than any success that John Lee Allen had achieved in his life. In his time, John Lee Allen prospered. He and his wife, Caddy, and their children would fill their home with happiness and love for about a decade. Sadly, on the afternoon of October 23rd of 1917, John Lee Allen left home in a seemingly perfect health, but while out and about, he abruptly fell ill with acute indigestion and died within a matter of minutes. The family was bereft, but they carried on the best they could. Caddy continued to entertain in the family home, and the children grew into adults and formed lives of their own, including one of the daughters, Liddell. Hi, baby. Is he coming up to sit? Aww. You're coming in there? Okay. Now, Liddell would get married and move away from home, but marital bliss was not to be hers. The marriage would crumble, and Liddell ended up moving back to her childhood home to live and care for her aging mother. In her retirement,
return to her hometown, Liddell ran into her high school sweetheart, Prentice Hemingway Savage, while he was visiting the family in Monticello. Ma'am? <laughs> You gotta get cozy. Are we good? <laughs> okay. Now, um, he was married at the time and working as an executive to Texaco Oil in Minnesota. Once he returned to Minnesota, they began oh. writing to each other regularly and thralled in an illicit love affair. Liddell and Savage devised a plan for him to leave his wife and run away with Liddell on Christmas. He faked a business trip and the pair went on a two week road trip from Arkansas to Minnesota. But after months of back and forth, Savage could not bring himself to leave his wife. He had a reputation to uphold, and Liddell was devastated. Her sorrow was her own, however. Those closest to her were unaware of her torment, but that would change at Christmas when Liddell had planned to run away with Princess. That Christmas, Liddell's mother threw her annual Christmas party at the house, and everybody who was anybody was there that night. For her part, Liddell went up to her room with a glass of punch, and a plate of snacks, and then poisoned herself with mercury cyanide. However, the death did not come for Liddell at night. The mercury cyanide was an over-the-counter treatment for syphilis at the time, and it wasn't strong enough to kill her quickly. The next day, she was hospitalized, and she spent a week in the hospital before dying there on January 2nd of 1949. Kagan was bereft and could not bear to face Liddell's room, so she sealed the room untouched and would stay that way for 40 years. After Katie Allen died in 1954, the Allen children sectioned the home into apartments, and soon after, the reports started rolling in. Tenants started seeing strange things and experiencing bizarre paranormal activity shortly after moving in. Shadowy figures would appear in photographs taken by residents in the house, and furniture moved around on its own. Objects around the house would disappear into thin air and many people claimed to see a woman standing in the window of Liddell's still-sealed bedroom. The story of Liddell grew into urban legend, and the Allen House was declared haunted by many people of Monticello. Coming to the 21st century, the Allen House goes under new ownership. In 2005, Mark Spencer moved his wife, Rebecca, and their two kids to Monticello after accepting a position at the local college. While exploring their new town, Rebecca turned on to North Main Street and stumbled upon the Allen House hiding behind overgrown foliage and an iron fence. She instantly fell in love with the neglected home, and despite learning about the Liddell's legend, she convinced her family that they were meant to live in that home. In 2007, the family moved in, and they quickly began renovations. During the intensive work, they unearthed artifacts from around the grounds and started piecing together stories of the Allen family, including Liddell. They opened Liddell's room for the first time in decades. It was a time capsule to the unfortunate woman's life. Under the floorboards, they found dozens of letters to Princess, from Princess to Liddell, and mapping, a map point plotting out the road trip that the couple had secretly embarked upon during their tumultuous affair, and the find was just absolutely fascinating. But they didn't fret too much about it, and Liddell's room actually would become their master bedroom. As they embarked to make the room their own private special retreat, they began experiencing strange activity in the house. Rebecca's first unsettling activity revolved around Jacob, their five-year-old son. She recalled, we started seeing Jacob in places he wasn't, doppelganger activity. She continued, it was not like we were seeing a ghost, we were just seeing our kid in a different place. Being level-headed people, the Spencers assumed that there must be some rational explanation for the ongoing ons, and they assumed it was fumes or mold or that was distorting their vision. But as they eliminated one explanation after the next, they grew more desperate for answers. Perhaps they were starting to believe. Perhaps they were hoping to discredit the impossible. But eventually, they did bring in paranormal investigators, and the findings shook the Spencers to their core. To quote the investigators, I'm sorry, y'all, you will live in a haunted house. The house was rich with electric voice phenomenon, as the investigators reported over 40 voice phenomena and had their own paranormal experiences during the investigation. One investigator had to be called off. One investigation had to be called off as a tree branch inexplicably fell as the investigators were visiting the property and slightly damaged their equipment. While the recordings and activity shocked the Spencers, they were not deterred from living in the home. While the activity had been unusual, it hadn't been threatening in any way. The 
the only thing that was uh, that's uneasy is your own mind about it, said Rebecca. When your mind tells you things that are there that aren't, it's like being a kid and being afraid of the dark. You don't know what's there and what isn't. That said, it hasn't been smooth sailing. For over 10 years, one of the Spencer's sons refuses to use the bathroom on the first floor because he heard someone or something say his name. Rebecca says she's seen a black outline of a man that she calls the Shadow Man. He strikes her as a cowboy, saying she's seen his boots walk in the master bathroom and has seen him walk out the front door. But investigators have noted many more spirits than Marina. Liddell, Joe Lee, Caddy, Alan Bonner, a baby, a man with a gruff voice have all been identified. Rebecca thinks there's probably more, but her skeptical side makes her hesitant to name them. She has to be skeptic, she says. It has to happen to me, or I don't believe it. The stories I hear are incredible. Still, untouched rocking chairs are known to move on occasion. Footsteps in the attic and faint sounds of a crying baby are not uncommon. Though they may remain skeptics at heart, the Spencers have opened the house to guided tours and dinner parties to share their beautiful haunted home with others. Some say they have even been touched by invisible forces. She says, you always have to... It's always our, your most skeptical people that come through and have something happen to them. If you don't believe in ghosts, that's okay. But if you stick around here long enough, we might change your mind. <laughs> Between the fascinating finds during the res uh, renovation and the haunted happenings in the home, Mark Spencer was inspired to write a pair of books, A Haunted Love Story and Monticello, ensuring that the Allen House tales will live on. So if you ever find your way down to Mont Monticello, Arkansas, Take a swing by the Allen House. Even if it's not over for a tour, you might see Liddell looking out at you from her bedroom window. <laughs> so, Chris, how dare you ignore him so? He's <laughs> something. But, so we do have a, a question from Alex, and uh, it's not necessarily about this, but uh, what is the coolest EVP you've ever heard? Coolest EVP? I don't know, the one that Tiffany played for us on Sunday, did you hear that? I personally did not. So it was an EVP they got in the jail cell um, uh, at, Hanover at Hanover Tavern. And I didn't realize it, but there was a female child that was actually hung out on the grounds there because she had attacked another young boy. That's right. Uh, and she played it, and it sounds like she says, are you here to play with me? And I was like, that was creepy, because you guys know me. I don't do ghost kids. I don't like a lot of ghost kids. <laughs> Ghost kids, yeah, they're, they're, it kind of freaks you out. Because, I mean, that's the, the other thing. I mean, yes, maybe it could be a ghost kid, but <clears throat> there's a, I think it's a certain level of vulnerability yeah. when it comes to ghost kids. And it, it really, is it tugging at your heartstrings? Is it, is it not a child? Is it something pretending to be a child? Is it yeah. a shining effect? Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I so. did watch The Shining way too young. <laughs> But yeah, so all kinds of interesting ones from up there. <laughs> but yeah, so we got some good interaction tonight here. All right, so what we are going to do next is we are going to wind down through Pulaski County, just south of Little Rock, and we'll find the little community of Woodson and an infamous stretch of State Highway 365. This lonely road is purportedly the stomping ground of a famous ghostly hitchhiker. For years, there have been chilling tales of a lone woman hitchhiking at night up and down this stretch of highway. She wears tattered clothes and her hair is disheveled, leaving a lasting and unsettling impression on all who cross her path. In 1973, a man picked up a girl on a bridge near Wrightsville, just to the north of Woodson. She was covered in bruises and cuts. She told the man that she had been in a car accident. When they arrived at the house that she claimed was hers, she disappeared from the car. He went to the door anyway and found a father whose daughter had died on a bridge near Wrightsville the month before. In another encounter, a man was navigating the inky darkness of Highway 365 on a rainy night when he caught sight of a figure standing on the side of the road ahead. He stopped to find a young woman soaked to the skin. She gratefully accepted the offer to catch a ride and gave the man an address in Redfield. The man tried to make small talk about the recent high school football game as they drove, but his seemingly shy passenger remained quiet. When they arrived at the address, she seemed to be asleep, and there were no lights on at the house. 
so he decided to knock on the door first to make sure it was the right place. A woman came to the door and turned on the porch light as he smiled and spoke up. Good evening, ma'am. I believe I have your daughter. I picked her up a few miles down the highway and she seems a little out of sorts. I was wondering if you wouldn't mind helping me get her into the house? The woman stepped back from the door with a fearful look and the man felt a sudden sense of dread. That is not my daughter, she told him. My daughter died in an accident four years ago tonight. Josh ran back to his car through the muddy yard and ran, yanked open his passenger door and rain pitter-patted on the empty seat. Another man picked up a girl near Woodson and drove her to, to, drove her, to her home in Redfield. When the man got out of the car to open the door for the girl, she disappeared. The man went to the door anyway, and a grieving father told him his daughter had someone drive her home every year on the anniversary of her death. The creepiest story has a man picking up the girl near a bridge in the rain. Because the girl was soaked through, he put his coat around her shoulders. When they arrived at the house where the girl said she belonged, she disappeared, taking his coat with her. After his conversation with the dead girl's mother, the man visited the girl's grave, where he found his coat draped across her headstone. These tales, as unsettling as they are, pale in comparison to the other woman that has been seen along this stretch of road. There is another woman who has been reported to throw herself in front of cars here, and when she is inevitably struck, the terrified drivers leap out of the car only to find that there is no woman to be found. Some have talked of a hitchhiker that preaches of the second coming if you stop for them, and then there is the classic urban legend of those who want to try and summon a spirited encounter. If you can stop in the middle of the highway, turn off your headlights, and honk three times, a ghostly motorcycle will appear and drive right through your car. We do not recommend testing such urban legends, as you're just as likely to have another motorist drive into your darkened car in the inky blackness of a rural Arkansas night. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, ma'am. Yeah, Beth has a strict no ghost kid policy at, at Alice. <laughs> I mean, the the funny well. thing is, is the ghost that likes me the most at Hanover Tavern is the child ghost in the theater. And I'm okay with her. For some reason, I'm fine with her. But the rest of them, no. She kept touching me. I didn't like it. Yeah. She likes to play. She's done that every year, hasn't she? Yeah, she likes to play. Yeah. Tag, tag and hide and go see. Yeah, so she was probably tagging you. Tag your it. She kept doing it, so. Because <laughs> you weren't responding. Tag your it. Yeah. Tag your it. Makes me itchy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, the hitchhiker stories and scary tales to tell in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right, so we're going to move down to Van Buren and King's Opera House. On a sharp bend in the Arkansas River, close to the border of Oklahoma, stands the city of Van Buren. In 1831, a post office was built in the area, and it was named after Secretary of State and future President Martin Van Buren. Fourteen years later, in 1845, the name would be carried over to the newly incorporated city of Van Buren. As the city grew, various amenities would open within its borders, and eventually including the King's Opera House, which was built in 1891 and 1892. While it consisted Excuse me, while it considered a fine establishment, the King Opera House is not the best known for its performances that it has hosted, or even its beautiful restoration. Instead, it's noted for its connection to a murder and the rumors that it is haunted by the murdered actor. Can you read this? No, sure. Mm -hmm. According to the legend, an actor by the name of Charles Tolson was running away with Allie, the daughter of Dr. Parchman, whom he had fallen in love with. The doctor rushed to the depot on horse and buggy and intercepted their departure and proceeded to beat Tolson to death with a horsewhip. But that's actually not how this commonly shared tale went down. Or did he? <laughs> Charles Townsend was the owner of the Tolson, excuse me, Charles Tolson was the owner of Tolson Stock Company, a traveling acting group. He was married to Lorena Tolson, an actress, and mother, was mother of Excuse me, she was mother of their son, France. France. Tolson was a well-respected well and famous actor in the area. On September 3rd, 1903, Tolson Stock Company was finishing their week-long engagement at the King Opera House 
and Tolson retired to the Collins Hotel that evening with family before waking up to travel to the Frisco Depot for the train department, departing for Sport Smith. Tolson and the 11 actors with his troupe arrived at the depot at 7.45, and Tolson left his troupe to purchase tickets for the train. Abe Tibbetts, who was hired to carry their luggage, stood with Tolson at the purchasing window. Dr. Parchman, who had been waiting inside the depot in the waiting room, stepped outside and called Tolson's name. Though some witnesses report Parchman never spoke to Tolson. After Tolson turned his attention to the doctor, Parchman pulled a 44 caliber revolver out of his pocket and fired a shot, missing Tolson. As he turned to run from gunfire, another shot st struck Tolson in the back above his hip, and the force of the gunshot to his back forced Tolson to spin and face Parchman, who fired one more shot into his chest. The bullet struck a watch in Tolson's pocket, and the impact forced him to the ground. After firing the shots, Parchman turned and quietly walked away. Tolson was put on the train to Fort Smith, where he was admitted to the Bell Point Hospital and succumbed to his wounds the next day. On his deathbed, Tolson declared he had only ever given Allie good advice and considered Dr. Parchman as a good friend. Parchman shocked Tolson that morning on suspicion that he was taking Allie away. He received this information the night before the shooting from a vinegar salesman named C.G. Murray. There's no proof that Tolson was running away with Allie as she wasn't even present on the morning of the shooting. The two did know each other, but nothing points to an inappropriate actions taking place on Tolson's part. The truth of the situation is that 17-year-old Allie may have been attracted to the well-regarded Tolson, or even just to his profession as an actor and may have considered following him and his troop away from Van Buren to escape her overbearing father. This idea may have been misconstrued by the vinegar salesman and related to the uh, obsessive father, all without the knowledge of the faithful man, family man, Tolson. According to notes found in her purse, Allie may have had plans to attempt to run away with the troop, but nothing came to fruition. J.C. Godley, the lead actor for Tolson's staff company, told newspapers that Allie was starstruck, and Tolson had told her that what she needed to do was stop hanging around and go home where she belonged. In fact, Murray, the vinegar salesman, seemingly had an interest in Allie. Several accounts reported to the newspapers at the time said that Murray had less than honorable interest in Allie and was jealous of her attention to Tolson. Allegedly, he had said to Allie that his wife was an invalid in Louisiana nursing home, and upon her passing, he wanted to marry her. Some believe that Murray was deliber had deliberately lied to Dr. Parchman fabricating the relationship between Allie and Tolson to make sure that he would step in and keep Allie on a tight leash in Van Buren. After he shot Tolson, Parchman made his way home, contacted Sheriff Jim Pedcock to tell him what he had done. A warrant was issued for Parchman on the charge of assault with the intent to kill. Colonel Oscar I. Uh, Miles was a very close friend of Dr. Parchman, stepped in to defend the doctor in court, and by the time the trial began in June of 1904, several of the witnesses were missing, including Murray and Allie, who had left Van Buren immediately after the shooting. According to a report from the Van Buren Argus, uh, Colonel Miles presented the case of the defense, briefly dwelling on the different degrees of murder and how justifiable murder would be his defense. His closing argument referred to Tolson as the would-be destroyer of Parchman's daughter's purity. The jury brought the argument and hook, line, and sinker and found Dr. Parchman not guilty by reason of self-defense. The man literally got away with murder. After the trial, Tolson's wife continued traveling with the acting troop and remarried a year after the shooting. Allie was sent to live with a family member in Missouri and never returned to Van Buren. Dr. Parchman tried to live a quiet life after the murder, but while the jury had acquitted him, the community had, was not of the same opinion. He received very little sympathy and was uh, many were outspoken condemning him. Today, the story of Tolson lives on in the spirited tale of the King's Opera House. It said Tolson's ghost now haunts the location of his last performance. Several former employees at the Opera House have reported feeling like they're not alone, often feeling like someone's in the room with them, Others have seen a ghost of a younger, young actor dressed in a top hat and a Victorian-style coat searching the theater for his true love. Bill Radcliffe, the current manager at the Opera House, says that he will hear sounds when no one else is in the building. The sounds fill the fill the floor. Excuse me, read, read me here. You are right there. <laughs> I just started throwing words in that were not there. Okay, let's try that again. 
The sounds of things falling outside his office will draw his attention, but when peeking outside, you will find everything in its place where it belongs. Bless you. Bless you. Radcliffe, bless you. Radcliffe says that when he comes and goes out every day, he makes sure to acknowledge those who have graced the stage before him. When locking up in the evening, he'll say, Charles, take care of the place. I'll see you tomorrow. That is the proper way you exit when speaking with a ghost. Yes. <clears throat> All right. So we are not going to go too terribly far. We're just going to move south across the Arkansas River, where we will land in the city of Fort Smith. What started as a military outpost in 1817 grew into what is now the third largest city in the state and a bustling manufacturing center. In 1852, a Mr. Sutton built himself a beautiful Italian that style home just a few blocks from the river. <laughs> just a few blocks from the riverfront. She's a baby. <laughs> Please oh, don't oh, drop the tablet. I'm trying not to. Uh, all right. So, in 1852, Mr. Sutton built himself a beautiful Italianette style home just a few blocks from the riverfront. The home would be abandoned during the Civil War era, and it was turned into a Union Army hospital for a time. The home would languish for a number of years until 1882 when William Henry Harrison Clayton purchased the home, restored it, and doubled its size into the beautiful Victorian Gothic style that puts its best foot forward today. Clayton, the federal prosecutor in the frontier court of Judge Isaac C. Parker, uh, Mr. Clayton uh, and his wife, along with their seven children, lived in the home from 1882 to 1897. Mr. Clayton was appointed <laughs> District Attorney of the United States for the West District of Arkansas by President Ulysses S. Grant in 1874. His twin brother, John K. Clayton, a U.S. Senator, was assassinated amidst a contentious election in 1889. His assassin was never found. Some believe his ghost is one, that haunt, is, uh, one of the many that haunts the Clayton House to this day. The family would depart the house after 15 years when Mr. Clayton was appointed the judge of the Central District of Indian Territory in McAllister, which is in present-day Oklahoma. <clears throat> While they never returned in life, Mr. Clayton did return there in death. After passing away at the age of 80, he was interred at Fort Smith National Cemetery about a mile from his old home. As you walk through the doors of this magnificent home, you step back in time to an era of elegance. A total restoration of the home was conducted from 1970 to 1977, and the 6,000 square foot home has eight main rooms, including a formal parlor, sitting room, a study, a formal dining room, an upstairs common area, and four bedrooms, each containing an ornate coal burning fireplace. A semi-detached servants' quarters and kitchen have been reconstructed on their original foundation. Today, you can view beautiful woodwork throughout the home. The large, airy spaces in which the family of six daughters and one son, one son once lived, uh, once lived and played, and several Clayton family belongings. Special features include the original tall cypress double front doors a massive and elegant original black walnut staircase, and Victorian-style bay windows. In addition to housing the Clayton family artifacts, such as the family Bible, Mr. Clayton's walking stick, Mrs. Clayton's writing desk and tea table, and many photos, the home is complete with ornate period furniture for every room. This is in thanks to Agnes Oglesby, who donated her estate of Victorian furniture to the museum after the home was restored. Other local sit, uh, citizens have also gifted magnificent pieces to the home, including an orchestra square piano manufactured in 1884 and a Beckwith pump organ from about 1894. They packed this place with Victorian era goodies. It is, it you sounds know, stunning. How many things got brought in with it? Yeah, exactly. It sounds absolutely stunning. Now, three large porches do look out upon the look out upon the spacious grounds of the Clayton House, which feature a Victorian herb garden and a large Victorian-style gazebo. It all seems to be a beautiful and tranquil place, one that would bring out the inner calm and in most, but not is all to be taken at face value. People have described one ghostly apparition as the tall man. 
He is dressed all in black, wears a hat, and walks angrily around. Some debate the idea that this could be John Clayton, the assassinated twin brother of William Henry Harrison Clayton, and staff and visitors have reported hearing footsteps, boots stomping, and door slamming in one of the second floor bedrooms. These unsettling encounters are slightly softened by the mysterious music and singing that has sometimes been heard throughout the house. Another spirit seen around the Clayton property is described as the woman in the brown dress. This ghost has a peaceful aura about her, with her gray hair piled up in a bun on top of her head. When she is seen, she tends to stay quite still. Some think that this may be Mrs. Clayton, while others theorize that it is a nurse from the time the property was a hospital. The truth is that no one knows for sure. Some visitors have said that they felt like they were touched when no one else was around, and one woman even had her hair tugged. Perhaps one of the Clayton children playing a little prank? Paranormal investigators who have had the opportunity to check out the historic home have come away with some recordings of disembodied voices in the background of the home. A visit to Clayton House is a treat for spooky people and fans of historic architecture alike. If you get to stop by this corner of Arkansas, be sure to stop in and, for, and step, take a step back in time and perhaps a step alongside some of the spirits that reside there today. Can we go into Arkansas? Sure, <laughs> yeah. We, we, it sounds like there's some pretty neat places to check out there. And I'll give, uh, actually, give Rick a little shout out here. He noted early, very early on in the chat when we were, said we were doing Arkansas, oh yeah, the Crescent Hotel. Yes, I obviously here. could not do this without touching on the Crescent Hotel, so that's here. where we're going next. Here we go. So, moving north to the Ozark Mountains, close to the border with Missouri, we have the city of Eureka Springs and the Crescent Hotel and Spa. In 1879, Eureka Springs emerged as the center of sol solace and rejuvenation. Native Americans originally discovered this haven of natural springs with healing properties surrounded by the lush forests and the rugged cliffs, and that this enchanting location was not to be kept secret. Eureka Springs quickly blossomed excuse me, into a vibrant community with 2,000 homes and over 15,000 residents by 1880. Governor Powell Clayton, a leader with a king eye for progress, recognized the immense potential in Eureka Springs and was determined to unlock its full splendor. In the late 19th century, Clayton, in collaboration with Eureka Springs Improvement Company, orchestrated the arrival of the Frisco Railroad to Eureka Springs, a groundbreaking development that would re revolutionize transportation and open new avenues for growth. Eureka Springs Improvement Company, uh, understanding the town's burgeoning reputation as a healing retreat, knew that the Grand Resort Hotel was necessary to host throngs of visitors, and they set their sights on creating a haven of opulence and elegance. Ground was broken in 1884, and by 1886, the Crescent Hotel, an architectural masterpiece, stood atop the Crescent Mountain, offering breathtaking views and luxurious accommodations. Following its grand opening in 1886, the Crescent Hotel swiftly established itself as the premier destination for the elite and well-to-do. The lavish accommodations, the breathtaking views, the top-notch amenities drew guests seeking respite from their bustling lives. The hotel quickly gained a reputation for its opulent ballrooms, exquisite dining experiences, and exceptional service. For the next 15 years, the hotel was operated by the Eureka Springs Improvement Company and was exclusive a hot spot for the elite. In 1902, the hotel was leased to the Frisco Railroad for five years. Due to slow business in the winter, the Crescent College op was opened and provided education to women. The college flourished, offering a comprehensive curriculum and fostering a vibrant academic community. Over the years, the college gained their reputation for its commitment to excellence, attracting students from across the country. Although Crescent College for Women eventually closed in 1934, its legacy remains embedded in the hotel's rich history. In 1937, Norman Baker, a charismatic yet fraudulent figure, acquired the hotel and embarked on an ambitious adventure. He transformed the hotel into the Baker Cancer Clinic, presenting himself as a visionary healer and claiming to possess the elusive cure for cancer. Baker, known for his dubious nature, had amassed considerable wealth from cancer sufferers, leveraging his self-proclaimed abilities. He 
christened the Crescent as the castle in the air and broadcast against controversial claims over the radio, asserting he could heal cancer without resorting to surgical procedures. Despite his grandiose proclamations, Baker's treatments and medical theories had no credibility in the legitimate medicine world. Nonetheless, his methods and his outrageous claims caught the attention of the American Medical Association, served as a stark example of what cancer treatment should not involve. However, it was Baker's unethical practices in acquiring patients that ultimately led to his downfall. In 1940, he was arrested and imprisoned for mail fraud, putting an end to his reign. During the Baker tenure at the Crescent, he made extensive modifications to the hotel. The interior underwent a lavender-themed remodeling, adding a distinctive touch to the premises. Notably, Baker ensured that his own security with an escape route from his office suite to the, on the first floor, concealing a hidden staircase, and his office boasted a unique six-sided desk that served as the nerve center for his six different businesses, showcasing his entrepreneurial spirit and scrupulous, unscrupulous nature. In 1946, a significant chapter unfolded in the history of the Crescent Hotel as it underwent a period of renovations, which proved positive for the Crescent Hotel. Its reputation as a luxurious retreat remained solid for the next 20 years. Unfortunately, in 1967, a faulty wire unleashed a devastating fire across the upper floors of the hotel. The penthouse level was ravaged and a significant portion of the fourth floor also sustained serious damage. The need for renovations and repair took center stage, but it proceeded in fits and starts over the next several decades. Finally, in the late 1990s, significant strides were made in repairing and enhancing the aging grand old dam of the Ozarks. And with these changes came the bizarre details of manifestations. In the last several decades, the Crescent has hosted no less than 17 paranormal television shows. They've all been there. They get on, they get on TV a lot. Yes. Highlighting the spooky and macabre chapters of the building's past, its fame reached new heights in 2019 when an accidental discovery revealed the dumping ground of Norman Baker, the charlatan who ran the fraudulent cancer curing hospital. An archaeological excavation uncovered hundreds of bottles of Baker's secret formula and jars containing surgical medical specimens removed from the patients. The discovery of the specimens coincided with the appearance of a dark figure appearing in the space that was used as the morgue. There has been an increase in cold spots and reports of people being touched. These ghostly occurrences are showcased during nightly hotel ghost tours. While make some make sense in the light of, excuse me, some make sense due to the grim chapter of the history, uh, hotel's past. But what of the other spirits and supernatural phenomena? The recurring incident happens as, excuse me, a recurring incident. You're very distracting, ma'am. <laughs> Just so y'all know, she's like bathing my finger over and over again. There's not going to be any skin left. All right, so interesting reoccurring incident on a spot on the third floor where the hotel connects to an annex built onto, uh, onto the hotel when it was a hospital. Some believe that this area is a portal to the other side. Multiple guests have grown faint, with few passing out briefly. And at this spot, the nicely on the nice nightly ghost tour with no uh, reasonable explanation. The occurrences go in spurts, with many happening over several weeks or months, and then none for some time. Guests suddenly turn pale, falling against the wall in a faint. Although the loss of consciousness does not last very long, it's a uh, and complete recovery is immediate. Some think that the, it further substantiates the hotel's sort of supernatural connection to the paranormal. I would totally be that person who faints. <sighs> Just saying. Then there's room 218, the home of Michael. Now, Michael was an Irish stonemason who fell to his death when building the home back in the hotel back in the 1880s. Now, while he's willing to share his room, his appearance can be a bit unsettling to the unsuspecting guests. Then there's Theodora. For sure it's not Theodosia, right? <laughs> yes, okay, the Theodora. Kidding. Theodora, a cash patient who was fumbling for her keys outside room 419. She also has a reputation for tidying up for guests when they leave the room. 
Then there's the spirit of four-year-old child named Brecky. He has been seen throughout the uh, hotel, often playing with a ball. He passed away there due to complications from an appendicitis when he was visiting there with his parents in the late 1800s. The hotel had an in-house doctor, uh, Dr. John Freeman Ellis at the time. He is still carrying about his duties in the room that was once his office, which was room 212. If he's not seen, guests will sometimes report the smell of his cherry pipe tobacco. Then there is the beloved hotel and grand man uh, hotel general manager, Morris. Morris ran the hotel for 21 years before passing away. He's buried on the hotel property, and he still is regularly seen and heard throughout the hotel. Uh, we should note Morris and the cat. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Cats are the bosses, as we know. They are tiny furry gods. I took a picture of your cats and sent them to my friends. <laughs> They're like, oh, is that Doc? I was like, no, yeah. that's 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 my boss's cat. <laughs> but they misread it as the cat being my boss's. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are. They are. They are. All right, so the hotel draws thousands of visitors every <laughs> year to its ghost tours, and some dare to call it the most haunted hotel in the United States. Well, we try not to jump to the most haunted debates. It's definitely got volume and variety of activity, so it makes it understandable why some might feel justified to make such a claim. I definitely want to go visit. Yeah. I've always wanted to visit this place. So, apparently Rick got to go. He stayed in room 419, and he said he smelled that tobacco smoke on the second floor. I mean, out of all the ones, I'd be cool with hanging out with the Irishman. <laughs> we'll, bring some, we'll bring some Irish whiskey with us. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Now, we do have one final stop for tonight, and this is obviously a little bit tip of the iceberg type stuff. Our Arkansas, lots and lots of hauntings. We do already basically have an entire script for an Arkansas point two, part two, which we will do at some point in the future. I gotta get through all the states before I we, start coming back to parts. Yes, we would like to be able to do that, so uh, it'll be a little while before we circle back on that, but... If you miss something tonight, well... It might be on part two. It might be on part two, or we might cover it in another kind of specialty episode or something like that at some oh. point down the line. So... I'm tired. <clears throat> Just a smidge. No, 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 no. So, th three, three of the four cats are on laps right now. Four Yuna, in bed. Yeah, Yuna, Nico... Oh, oh there oh, goes oh, Vincent. Sorry. Uh -huh. Vincent, you had to prove me wrong, didn't you? <laughs> you called me out, I had to get off. You didn't come off anybody? But. Yeah, Miss Lulu is uh, up in bed. Yeah, she uh, she's an early bed lady. Yes. Oh, she's trying to take the bed before I get there. Yep. But, so this final stop, we're going to turn our attention to Arkansas City and the remote southeastern part of the state. It's not too far from the Mississippi River. In the center of town stands Desha County Courthouse, which has experienced a variety of bizarre activity in its time. Built in 1900, the Romanesque-style brick building is painted a clean white color and features some elegant architectural flares, all of which is topped off by a four-story clock tower. It's the clock tower where, basically, we start with the weird occurrences. It is said that the bells in the tower do not ring at the right time because of a ghost known as Willard. Willard's real name may have been Jim Williams, but for the sake of this story to make, uh, uh, but for the sake of this story, it uh, really doesn't matter all too much, except for the fact that uh, he has basically haunted this courthouse for almost the entirety of its existence. While alive, Willard was accused and convicted of a crime that he professed he did not do. Since his execution, the courthouse clock and bells have been cursed. In December of 2008, just three minutes before noon, the bell atop the old Desha courthouse rang only once. The bells were supposed to ring 12 times. The one time it did ring was three minutes early. Judge Mark Me uh, McElroy told a reporter and photographer that witnessed the malfunction that Willard, the courthouse's ghost, was evidently angry again. But this was nothing new for the clock as it never worked right since Willard's death at the turn of the century. Now, Willard's story began between 1899 and 1903, when a man lost uh, money gambling in an Arkansas City hotel uh, and took revenge by setting fire to this hotel and several others in the area. 
be all burned to the ground. Willard was captured and convicted of these arsons. He was then sentenced to hang at the courthouse. Willard proclaimed, his, uh, proclaimed until his death that he was innocent. D. Fowler, whose grandmother served on that jury that convicted Willard of the crime, states that her grandmother heard Willard tell those who watched his execution, mm. I will curse the new E. Howard clock that sits atop this courthouse. I am not guilty, and to prove my innocence, this clock will never keep the correct time again. Some witnesses stated that the clock stopped when Willard died. Judge McElroy on the bench since 1993 told a reporter that interviewed him that the clock has never worked appropriately since that time. One night, several years before this interview, the bells rang throughout the night, keeping the residents awake for hours before the judge could arrive to shut them off. In the 1970s, the town decided to run the clock off of electricity rather than weights, hoping that this would solve the problem. It didn't. In more recent years, the town... Uh, brought in a clock expert from Florida who changed out the old parts with new ones, but it appears the clock remains cursed. Judge McElroy and many of his staff who work at the historic courthouse feel strongly that a ghost roams its halls. Many have heard doors slamming and footsteps in areas where no one can be found. Dacia County Clerk Beth McMahon states that even the clocks on the phone, staff's phones malfunction. The dates on their phones often reflect one day behind, and when people try to fix this, they find their efforts futile. Frustrated, McElroy has even considered options to try and undo the curse. The town has considered bringing in someone who can get rid of the ghost, and McElroy has proposed holding a mock trial where they would undo Willard's conviction of guilt in the arsons. But these ideas have been tabled for now, and it appears Willard's ghost still does not. Rest in peace. Ta da! We did a thing. We did it! So, that's another episode in the books. Haunted Arkansas, another state down. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, funny mentioned, uh, Patrick mentioned at the early on in the chat that it'd um, be really cool if we did Haunted Missouri sometime. Guess what? Uh, guess what's next? <laughs> On in Missouri, two weeks from today. Do, 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 do. You get Patrick. Our, our, uh, our, our people in the chat are all over it tonight. Rick uh, calling out the Crescent Hotel before we mentioned it. Patrick calling out Missouri before we mention it. We're, we're, we're all kind we're all You good. guys are in the board tonight. Yes. Everybody's in the zone. Uh, make sure. Haunts of Richmond board. <laughs> the hive mind. I haven't had a phone to follow chat tonight, sorry. Nope. I have been kittyized. <laughs> Rick says uh, Michael wouldn't complain if you brought him some Irish whiskey. <laughs> I have no problem bringing some Irish whiskey, some Kerrygold cheese. will make the man feel like he, he still remembered. And thank you, Patrick. He said that was an exceptionally good episode. Yay. So thank Aww. you. We try. We do try. Really busy. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't finish editing this until... Five o'clock. So yeah, late. so just a couple hours before we hit the air. So, yeah, it was uh, really coming down to the wire. Well, you but, also got hung up on a theater that I found that you're like, wait a minute, this, this timeline is not lining up. Oh, yeah, I wound up throwing that to the next episode entirely because they talked about a ghost haunting a place that, well, the ghost... This ghost story predated the actual existence of the place by a half century. Like, oops. Like something's not lining up here. Something that wasn't lining up. So that's going to require some more searching. Like, extract that story, move it over. We'll do more research later. But yeah, so we got um, yeah, Hunter, Missouri in a couple of weeks. Um, we're kind of we get a little bit of a chance to uh, personally catch our breaths in the next month. We do have some things going on, but uh, we I, do have a Valentine's Day tour. We have oh, yeah. Lee. oh yes, that's right. And I I still have to put that on uh, Facebook. Yeah, I still gotta write it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> so that's gonna be two weeks from Wednesday. Yep. And uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be 
It's gonna be. It's Churchill Chillers. It's just special Churchill. It's Chillers. a yeah special Churchill He's Chillers a twist. Yeah, special Churchill till Chillers. A little bit of a twist. Um, to get some more love stories in there. Yeah. yeah. I've been well, working hard on that one actually. Spooky, spooky love stories. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, they're all spooky related. Spooky, all spooky stuff related. But we're we're not gonna get that sappy. I'm being I'm being a very good boy and making sure that there's <laughs> at least like a ghost or something spooky involving each story. Yes. <laughs> so if you want to uh, if you want to sign up for that, it is already on the website. So that will be Valentine's Day, which is a Wednesday. So middle of the week, but it's at seven o'clock, so it's not too terribly late. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you can grab dinner at Patrick Henry's Pub or at the Hill Cafe and then go out the Liberty. To or the Liberty. Yep. We have so many restaurants up on Church Hill now, guys. Mm -hmm. Check them all out. Yep, and uh, yeah, and, and heck, you don't even have to join them for dinner beforehand because mm -hmm. you can go uh, for dinner afterwards. Yeah, you can go for dinner afterwards. I'm not sure if, how late Liberty is open, but Patrick Henry's is open until two a.m. seven days a week, and I think. Uh, Hill Cafe is open late most nights yeah, as well. So, yeah. So, a couple of restaurants close by. You can have uh, have dinner before or after the tour. Come on out. Make it a spooky Valentine's Day. Because, Just well, hell no. that's the only Roses way. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'd rather be doing something spooky with you. Yes. Aww. Yeah. That's the, uh, the, that's really the only way to celebrate Valentine's Super. Day in our book. Yes. It needs to be spooky. It needs to be spooky. It needs to be spooky. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, and yes, oh, we love Patrick Henry's too. We've had dinner there a couple times this past week, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, very good. Excuse me. Sounds like I need I'm to. I'm sorry, I'm need... still recovering. <laughs> it's been very busy and draining two weekends. Yeah. Um, but he was like looking at me because my stomach is growling again. Oh dear. I well, that was why I had, a, had another sandwich before we got on the show. Yeah, I need to have some cheese before I go to bed. Yeah. So, anyways, anything else? Anything else? Andrew, anything else? Uh, I'm sure there's something that we're missing. Oh, probably. We're, uh, we're sleep deprived. Yeah, yeah, we're a little sleep, <laughs> sleep deprived. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's. Um, on Marshall House tour next month. Yes, yeah, that'll be at the end of the month. So yeah, I mean, we'll, yeah, that's something. <laughs> um, I think it's three. It, it is three weeks from this Saturday. There you go. Yep. That's close enough to yep. talk about it. Yep. So three weeks from this Saturday, we'll be at the John Marshall House yep. for our John Marshall tour again. And we did just do an investigation there with our. Paranormal tour operators. Yeah, yep. so new evidence, new yep. interesting evidence. Yeah, some yeah. interesting things happened. So uh, um, mm -hmm. Brad with CPRI was there, our good good friend CPRI, and uh, some interesting interactions. Yeah, yeah. We got to just chill out in the in the staircase. In, yep. For about like an hour total. <laughs> yep. You got to hear footsteps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah, that was weird. That was really weird. <laughs> I even like went and like I asked the people that were in uh, the kids' bedroom. Mm -hmm. I was like, "So, have you guys heard anything weird out here?" Like, I wasn't even leaving. I was just like, I was just gonna, I was checking in, and they're like, "No." I was like, "Interesting." <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it, it was. I mean, right from the get go, uh, our friend Ting um, from down in Orlando. Mm -hmm. um, she had an experience basically as soon as Brad started doing like his walkthrough introductory tour. Yeah. Um, I don't think didn't get out of the first room. Uh, yeah, or, but, she didn't go upstairs because she didn't want to hear anything. She wanted to just experience. Yes. Yeah. Um, so she was. Uh, Something rushed by, by her, her. Yeah. and then she um, stayed in that room, put out a motion detector, and the motion detector wound up. Um, Pick, like picking up on a couple of things, yeah. yeah so, uh, and Brad's equipment also went a little weird. Yeah, yes, Brad's equipment went weird. Our rug pile went off um, directly after a noise. Yes, and we were seeing that, that shadow figure in the front parlor by mm -hmm. the desk. And there was the they they did get a little bit of a um, catch on a couple of names. One of them, Andy and Johnny. Yeah, so we're not sure if Johnny was John Marshall or one of the children. There was a John Marshall Jr. I don't know if they called him Jr., but there, John Marshall had a son named John Marshall. Jesus. Technically two. One of them died as an infant, and then they had another one about six or seven years later. Um, Andy, I don't think, was a family name. No, no. So that one, I'm wondering if it had to do with one of the servants. It could have, yeah, could have been um, one of the servants or one of the enslaved people from yeah. before. 
um, Andy or Andrew, but yeah, it's, yeah. Quite the active night for, uh, we were there for only about like two and a half hours, but and it, was... it was pouring while we were oh, yes. there. I was like sitting there, I was like, man, I feel like it's like a little quiet in here. And then this morning, Chris texted me, hey, what's all the stuff that happened? And I just started listening. I was like, oh, it was not quiet. No, it wasn't quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Wasn't. But yeah, so very cool. All right, guys, we will catch you in two weeks. If we don't see you before then at a tour, have a good couple of weeks. Oh. Stay safe. So, yeah, we have three tours this weekend. Mm -hmm. Um Right, right, like, as we went on the air, somebody booked for... Friday? Thursday. Dang it. A Choose Your Own. So, Choose Your Own, Shaka Bottom on third. well... Yes, it, like, uh, who, actually, let me talk with Marsha first, because okay. I promised her the next Choose Your Own. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> well, you picked up Valentine's Day. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so, yes, um, Shadows of Shaco, Thursday, um, well, Lee will be on Capitol Hill Friday. And Saturday, Lee will be hosting our guy Travis is... Um, I dude. miss Travis. Huh? I miss Travis. So you get to see him Saturday. I'm and uh, that is going to be Creepy Tales on Campus. So this weekend you can catch Shadows of Shaco, Church. Capitol Hill, Capitol Hill um, and, Creepy Tales, on and Creepy Tales on Campus. And Chris and I will be at Bonaire Library on Saturday giving a talk at 3 or 3.30? 3 3.30. Uh, 3.30. 3.30. And, well, Sunday is still unspoken for. If you want to uh, do the Choose Your Own for this Sunday, there's still an opportunity for you all to jump on that. And remember, you got to book two days in advance and it's yep. two tickets. Exactly, yes. So, with that, we will go ahead. We will depart for this evening. Thank, uh, feel free again to drop us a note anytime. Happy to, always happy to hear from you. And uh, if we do not hope hear from you, we do hope to at the very least see you back here again in two weeks. So thanks again for watching, everybody, and hope you all have a good night. Good night. Bye.